And we just continue in the program, because I said it so many times, we are tight on time, we don't want to waste any time, and we stick around the topic of blockchain technology. Now we dig it a bit deeper, so we look a bit at it from an expert level. So if you actually want to build an app on blockchain, there is uh, some considerations to be taken. So, um, but I leave that to the experts. I can just tell you what the title is. I will not talk to the content. That's not on my expertise level. So navigating the Web3 dilemma, selecting the optimal black blockchain for your travel app. And I invite to the stage two experts in that field. We have Luca De Giglio um, and we have Michele Rubel. Please join me on stage. We prepared some nice seating here. We have a fireside chat with you guys. Um, you don't need me for that. As I said, this is a very complicated topic to me, so I leave it to them. So we have no confusions at all. Um, it should be on. Try it. Can you hear me? Oh, yeah. Can you hear me? Okay, hello, well. Hello. And also in terms of the, um, the introduction, I won't do much. You're coming from peak work. You are working with Web3 and blockchain, so you know your stuff. The same goes for you. You're founder for several companies. You have your own conference, your own blog podcast for Web3. You have your own consultancy company. But I, I think they will tell you yourself. So enjoy this. And also, if you have questions, um, at the end, if you have the time left, we have microphones here. Make sure to, to get up. Tell us who you are, what your question is, and we have some interaction. So yes, enjoy. Thank you so much for being here. Thank you, Leah. So uh, we have some slides, but I will start with um, a question because I need to understand, you know, the, the, the level of, of, of knowledge in blockchain. I'm start with a with a question: How many of you in this room yeah. own a digital wallet with cryptocurrencies? Could you raise your hands? Okay, it's more than twenty. We were wrong. You see? were right. You were right. Okay. Um, all right. So this is growing oh, nice. every year. There's a bit more. Uh, we still haven't got the you know. Okay, stick curve. Um, right, uh, I'll give you a very quick introduction about um, money in blockchains because in a way, blockchains are like a database with money. A database with users inside already. Imagine if Booking.com had a database which was open and you can access already every user in it and, uh, and the user has already the credit card on top. It's a bit like this. It's like a big API with, with money in it, right? It's a very simple way to explain it. So just to give you an idea, uh, forget Bitcoin. Bitcoin is like a trillion dollars, but we don't use it for, for travel. Maybe in the future, but I don't think so. And then we have Ethereum, which is about 300 billion. This is just the value of the ETH, of the money in it. It's not the ecosystem. The ecosystem is more. And then BNB. And then Solana, you see, is like 10 times less than Ethereum. So just to give you an idea that most money is in Ethereum, and we can't use Ethereum in, in travel because it's too expensive. So yeah, that's a bit the, the, the pie of where the money is. So there, there's no real money in blockchains which we can use for travel yet, right? And uh, this is more about not the, the value of the tokens, but the value of the ecosystem. And again, you can see, all right, it's covered there, but most of the money, again, is in Ethereum, and all the rest is, is very, very little. You see, like, Avalanche, or, or which Camino, for instance, is built on top of it, is 800 million, right? So before blockchains become important for travel, we need the money to come in, and we're not there yet, okay? And how will money come in in blockchains, again, like Camino or, or others? It comes through bridges. So if you have money in Bitcoin, or Ethereum or anything else, you have to bridge it to the chain which we're gonna use for travel. Or you go through an exchange. And again, there are no exchanges, I mean like Coinbase or Binance, where we can bring money into the travel industry. So the travel industry doesn't have yet money on chain. That's the message here. And the question is how we're gonna bring it. Um, now, before I ask a, a question to Michele here, is like the main, the topic of the, this, this discussion is, how do I choose a blockchain? I can't use Bitcoin because it's like not made for these things. I can't use Ethereum because it's too expensive. I have to go lower in this list. And so which, which one am I gonna use? How do you make this decision? There's many, many parameters you have to choose. I talked about money now, but there's also like, how fast is it? Do we need a very fast blockchain for travel? Probably yes. Uh, how secure is it? Which goes against speed. How centralized it is, et cetera, et cetera. So like, Michele, I'm going to ask you, if you had to launch a startup in the travel industry 
on chain, so on Web3, on blockchain. How would you choose the blockchain? What would you look at? Yeah, so there are, as you said, a number of parameters that are useful to be considered. Some of them technical, the ones you mentioned. Also, some of them not technical, as in how many people, how many businesses are already there in the protocol that you choose or in the blockchain that you choose. So definitely, number one, speed. You mentioned it. But talking about travel, we all from the travel industry around here. There's no blockchain, because blockchain is not meant for this, that is able to sustain the search traffic of the travel industry nowadays. So even if you go layer two, even if you go to something that is meant for speed in terms of blockchain, we're talking probably around, if we're very, very lucky, around a hundred of thousands of transactions per second, which is not even an order of magnitude comparable to what the, uh, the travel industry generates. So the travel industry generates like a normal DMC, just to name not the biggest business, generates around 500 million searches per day. So imagine the industry. So there's no blockchain that goes there. Blockchain is very good at storing and at certifying that the transaction did happen, but not about the search traffic, etc. So speed, yes. Speed of storing transactions, speed of tra tracing stuff that happens in the travel industry, not speed of search. That's, we're not going to get there. Maybe with quantum computers one day, but not no, now. Secondly, I would say the interoperability, composability, as we like to call it, which means with... The blockchain is nothing fancy, actually. It's, as you said, it's a database in the end with knowledge of the users, knowledge, not, not personal knowledge of users, knowledge of what the user is worth in terms of money, what the user did in the past many times, et cetera. So it's a very good small and slow database. And it's only as useful as the people that are using it, the businesses that are using it. But once they, keep, they start using it, uh, we in the industry invented standards, which are uh, probably you heard the terms ERC if you somehow follow in the industry. So standards of doing stuff, standards of representing money, standards of representing an asset on chain, etc. Since everyone is using those standards, you have composability. So you have applications that are men they, they can interact with each other without prior ideas, prior agreement, even sometimes, so that. For example, you can see how many points I have in a loyalty uh, program without being, having an agreement to the loyalty program company or something like that. This is composability, which is an intrinsic characteristic of blockchains that I'm thinking of now. So blockchains that are based on what Ethereum, I think, brought, the main thing that Ethereum brought to, to this world of blockchain, which is EVM, which means how do you write programs on Ethereum? And all these uh, nice blockchains that you're seeing there are actually, most of them actually, they have some component of EVM comp comp compatibility, which means that you can write with the same program, with the same standards on all of these, and then you choose one. But as soon as you choose one, you need to see how many people are already doing so. Because if that loyalty program company that I was mentioning before is minting their token points, whatever they call them, and tiers, etc., on another chain, you just can't interact. Well, you could, but it's much more difficult. So there is uh, speed, there is interoperability or people that are there, and I would say these are the two factors. And then I'm a little bit biased because, yes, you were mentioning Camino looking at me because I, am, I was an advisor, I'm now VP in Camino, uh, but I was using you know, a few other blockchains, public, etc. It really depends on the use case in the end. So, yeah, that's basically So the, the one important concept in blockchains is the block, blockchain trilemma, meaning you can't have everything. Every time you want it a bit faster, you maybe lose a bit security. If you want it cheaper, probably it gets also less secure. So you see like Ethereum has 979 protocols on top of it, much more than all, all the others, and it's the most expensive by far. Like yesterday I was trying to swap some tokens, it was like $50 in, in fees, and you were like, wow, this is just too much, it can't work. And it's the most successful blockchain, why? Because it's very secure. So you have cheaper ones, like, uh, let's say, Base from Coinbase is coming up very nicely. It's much cheaper, uh, but at the same time, it's not as secure as Ethereum, right? So it's really hard. Maybe the main message is, like, if you have to choose today 
a blockchain for your Web3 startup, it's a tough decision. Very tough. There's no real, there's no clear, you know, clear answer, especially because things change very fast. So maybe it's a good idea today and two months it's changed. So, but it's not also such a difficult decision because you can go multi-chain, right? It's like a vertible decision. So that's actually the, the good part. So yeah, you choose a blockchain basically. Well, first of all, you have to choose whether you go L1, L2, and maybe I can very briefly say what that means. So L1 is the basic stuff, right? You, Ethereum, and you know, the, the ones that are, uh, you know, the, the first to be implemented. Camino is one of them, by the way, uh, which are meant to be steering how the two principal, I would say, functionality of a blockchain are, or the few uh, principal functionality of blockchain are, are working. One of them is consensus. Weird word, as we like in blockchain, but that means basically who is going to be rewarded for uh, the functionality of the blockchain. So the blockchain, imagine, is a kind of a world computer, right? That processes transactions, processes program. But of course, you need real computers that are you know, doing this. And then how do you reward the people that provide the computers? in order to process stuff. And there, are, you know, there was proof of work once, which means, OK, you have basically to compute and have, it's proportional to the power that you, you, you give, the computational power. And now it, it, it proved to be uh, like, uh, very slow for a lot of use cases. And then it, now the, whole, the, the new wave is, is, uh, is basically uh, proof of stake, which means you put money into it. And the more money you put, the more uh, transactions you get to, to, to work with, which means the more benefits or the more rewards you get for processing transactions. Now, this is something that can incentivize a lot of adoption, might have a problem. For example, in a smaller environment as we are now, I mean, travel industry is a big travel industry, but imagine compare it to, to finance. Many fewer players, many bigger players, many big players that could be monopolizing the functionality. And so the idea is that a consensus algorithm that works for you, that is, to me, I'm very pragmatic on this, as decentralized as necessary to keep this uh, democratic, to abuse of a nice word, but not too much so that it's uncontrollable. That's the one thing I would say, without going to layer two necessarily. Maybe a way to explain this is like the, the very decentralized blockchain, like. Bitcoin or Ethereum, no one can stop it. There's no big red button to turn off Ethereum, right? Um, on the other side of the spectrum, you have the database, which is very fast and very cheap, but there's one big button. Somebody can turn it off. Where do you want to be on that range? Do you want to have it so decentralized that even if, you know, 50% of countries in the world want to stop the travel industry on the blockchain, they, can, they cannot stop it? Or maybe you don't need that kind of security because you know travel is not that exactly dangerous. Exactly. Right? It's not that dangerous, and in the end, it's business. So the the risk of having a malicious users is it's present, but it's not as important as the risk of people moving transacting money to each other, as in the Bitcoin, for example. Example. So yes, I agree. Uh, we are here in the industry. We have to protect ourselves against malicious users. But in the end, it's an industry that I think has all to gain in working together in the most efficient way. So I would say speed is much more important. In this case, that pure decentralization and, again, composability. So, you, you, yeah. Uh, well, if, every time you go to a travel conference, people are, I mean, for the last 20 years, w what are they crying about? Fragmentation, right? Everything's fragmented. And then somebody comes out and say, I sold the, the fragmentation, use my database, basically, right? And everybody else says, no, I'm not going to use that, your database, either because I don't trust you or because I'm making money out of my database, right? So blockchain comes in and says, this thing works only if it's completely, if it's, if it's a standard, if it's a protocol. You cannot have a closed blockchain, right? So if blockchain gets adopted, even if we don't have the censorship resistant aspect, which doesn't really matter as much as with Bitcoin or, or you know, money in general, that could solve the composability. It could solve the fragmentation. Like, a couple of speeches ago, there was this identity situation, right? Blockchain is the identity solved from the beginning, for instance, right? Exactly. So 
I mean, by the way, SSI in general and digital identity is one of the obvious use cases for blockchain. All the regulation uh, that are brought forward now for the European Union, for example, have their natural implementation in blockchain, be it one or the other that they will choose, we will choose collectively, but yeah. So for, for what you were saying, exactly as you said, so there is the need of a common layer of interaction, interoperability in the industry. The beauty of blockchain, it is not yet another API. Yes, you need an API to interact with it at the end, but first of all, you need an API and only one. Secondly, if you then decide to change blockchain, you could, because again, it's all compatible and standard. Secondly, for, the, for then transmitting a booking to someone, of course, you had to have online connectivity. But the fact that the, your counterpart is on or off or down for some reason at that specific time is not so important because the blockchain is really distributed. So you get all the data that you need to transact with a partner up until the transaction proper already in-house. So you don't need, for example, to look up value, call in a third party or anything. If it's, where it's good implemented, it's kind of a very, very distributed caching system, like the ones that we were dreaming about, the re one of the reasons why the GDSs were born, et cetera, et cetera. So I think that is a, a, an opportunity to, to write, in the end, less code to achieve the same functionality. Security is there, more or less. Uh, identity should be there or will be there once we have the credentials on chain, which is going to happen because the regulator says so. And then the value of transaction is there because you can see that your counterpart has X amount of tokens needed to, uh, to, to, for example, to start transacting without having a big contracting phase or so on. So I would say it's at the very least a very good way to try and buy connectivity to other partners. And at the very best, and I am, of course, a believer in this, is the new way of interacting among businesses. And I'm not talking about Camino necessarily. I mean, with, with Peakwork, we were experimenting with like public blockchains, with, with, uh, with consortium blockchains, even with DLTs, as in you know, the, the distributed ledger trans technology, which are basically the fundamental way of ten how transactionally uh, blockchain are built, but they're not distributed. So sometimes it also works in that way. It really depends on, on your goal. And actually it's not, I would believe, not necessarily only, a again, a transaction uh, technology decision. It's more of an industry decision on who else is there at a specific time. How do you see the adoption of that specific blockchain versus another one? So we, we kind of answer the question how to choose a blockchain, I would synthesize it saying it's very hard, it doesn't really matter. Just start with one and then you can go multi-chain or you can sw we can switch later. Let's go on something a bit more. I'm going to ask you a question we didn't prepare because it those. just came to my mind. I think this is like a question which is maybe going around the room. Oh, which is like we've been talking about blockchain for what, 15 years now? It's still not there. But we're still here. Uh, you, you know the hype thing Leah was talking before, hype or what was that, adoption? Blockchain is weird because it's not being adopted, I mean, in, in travel. It's been hyped a few times. It, it never dies. We always come back on these stages. I'm sure somebody's asking, why, why are these guys still talking about blockchain and nothing is happening, right? So that's my question for you. Why are we still here? Why they, why they still invite us to talk about this thing which never takes off? Okay, depending on the years you are on this stage, you might be call it Web3, you might be call it blockchain or something else, right? So I believe the technology itself has a value when it's about transacting with among par partners in general that don't necessarily trust each other or they have a hard time establishing an agreement with each other before starting to transact. Read the travel industry, not the, early, the, not the former, but probably the latter. It's a lot of months of negotiations before using an API, for example, most times. But, so that's, that's a, that has a value, but it's not as sexy as Web3 as the promise was, and still is maybe in some cases, of people being represented by their wallet with the history of the purchase and, all, and being all B2C, be having new uh, traveler uh, experiences, which are A, the low hanging fruits, means it's very easy to create something around it, but then it doesn't stick. Why it doesn't stick? Because it goes up and down with the hype. C gener generative AI, more or less, just because I have to say, because every <laughs> talks or chats has to say generative AI at some point. That is a fad, uh, probably, but the fundamental technology is there to stay. Same with, with, with blockchain. I would say it's, 
it's not true that nothing happens. It, businesses start tracking their supply chain, uh, doing backbone transactions, etc., which are very invisible, so that the general public doesn't necessarily see that. But this is happening. I mean, Ethia moved their uh, 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 loyalty program on chain. Uh, Tui was transacting in the supply chain in the, I think, 2018 on chain and stuff. So stuff happened. Stuff which is visible to the layman didn't yet. I still believe there is a problem of adoption where once the big ones are moving and once the big ones in the United States are moving, then the rest of the world will follow. And then by the wind ones, I probably mean Google and Apple because we are used to digital wallets. That's what we have on our phones. But they're not blockchain enabled. Why they're not blockchain enabled? Regulation. So I think once that is there, there will be this spike, as we see with generative AI. Until then, we're really slowly building. And then it goes with the hype, because that sounds like crypto, even if not necessarily means crypto. And so it goes with the cycle of the hype. So I would say, to answer briefly your question, I don't agree. <laughs> Stuff is happening. Stuff didn't happen with the speed we collectively thought we would, would have. But every iteration sees adoption in an industry level, not really in the fancy new stuff that people touch. I know I agree with what you say. It was a bit provocative. Uh, the, the reason it's not happening, in my opinion, is because it's, it's happening, but it's behind the scenes. And okay. that brings me to a kind of a metaphor about the blockchain. Everybody's waiting for blockchain to come from the top, like an, you know, new apps and stuff. Why well, actually it is changing how the internet works. That's why it's called Web3. So Web2 is the web, you know, the centralized web. We decentralized, so centralized, not decentralized web we have today. The one which produced big corporations, big monopolies or oligopolies. And blockchain is making the web different. So it's not making a, a new app. It's completely changing the internet. It's, everybody's working on the internet today. So if the internet changes, your business is going to have to adapt. It's like a house where the terrain is changing, like it gets water in it or something, right? So you can't see it, it's very slow. It's not the meteorite which is going to kill the dinosaurs, it's the plaques moving, Correct. right? And you don't feel the plaques moving until Africa detaches from South America. That's what's happening, probably it's Nasa really big. And probably as, as for your metaphor, Africa would not detach overnight. So you don't see a specific moment where everybody's switching out to blockchain. Hence, on-ramp is very important. Hence, moving stuff and money, for example, from the real world to chain and vice versa, getting paid out. Or in tourism, getting APIs to interact with blockchain without necessarily changing the whole infrastructure overnight to blockchain is very important. Also because money is involved. So when I go and sell a blockchain project, as Peakware, for example, I go and talk to the CMO, super happy. You have a proof of concept with Web3. We make a lot of, you know, it pays itself in media attention. You get, you know, I remember when you remember the, the first NFT room night. Now, we did it in, with different hats, wearing different, anyway, in 2021. That was crazy. I got a call from Vanity Fair talking to me, which is like never happened before. So you have that kind of immediate payback, and that's good. Once then you need to go to the CTO, he's understanding it and you know, wants to do a proof of concept again. And then a part of the transaction is probably steered on chain, etc. And then you go to talk to the CFO. And that's where the problems begin. Because you need to convince them Then, if you put money on chain, it's not out of the, of the, of the books of the company and is employed something. It's just, it's just in another bank. It's just a way of holding the money which solves the, uh, the cash flow problem. Because otherwise, I mean, our industry is made of prepayment and pay hours for the checkout, et cetera. Without that, it doesn't work. The margins are just too low. So if you say, I'm putting all this money on chain pre-transactions, and your CFO thinks about this is a prepayment, it will never fly. If you think this is moved in another way of storing the money, which is still money, then it works. And then you have all the benefits of saying, okay, you don't need to engage with an escrow company. You don't need to engage with deposit counterpayments because the counterparty risk is nullified by the chain. So that's something that you have at a ha moment. But in order to get to the ha ha moment with the finance department of a, 
you know, a touristic company, and I hope the CFOs among you won't be uh, like won't take it as an insult, but this is true. You have to fundamentally change the way you count money in a company, you count cash flow in a company, etc., which is something that takes time. So I think that is another way why an industry which is traditionally like ours has a hard time to, to get on board. Once they get on board, I think it will be an avalanche, not the blockchain, an avalanche as in, you know, a fast... Yeah, I guess if a thing. CFO has, has to kind of sell the idea to the upper management, maybe today I will tell them, show them the Bitcoin ETF, because Bitcoin was one of these things which only lives on chain, is weird, is like, you know, criminals, blah, blah, blah. And now Wall Street is selling it, right? So this opens the, the regulatory and the CFO kind of problem can be solved and say, look, Bitcoin has been accepted, so other things can be accepted too. All right, we have a couple of minutes for questions, if you want. Anything about, about blockchain? We have like two minutes approximately because we have to respect the team's break, but I want to make use of the time and now we have you two here. So is there any, oh, there's questions. Do we have a microphone? Wonderful. Would you please tell us who you are, who you represent and your questions? Hi, I'm Rohit Talwar from Fast Future. Wonderful. Uh, can you give us just one example in travel, hotel or whatever of an obvious application for blockchain? that they should be using right now, either directly or via an intermediary. Thank I'm you so much. Taking this one, yeah. So I keep saying loyalty, so I will repeat loyalty. Loyalty is, to me, the obvious use case because you have identity, which is something that we all struggle with. Who owns the customer? Who owns the traveler? Is a, you know, one of the tenants of the travel industry. And you know, the OTA is owning it, that after, check out the, after the check in the hotel owns it, etc. With blockchain, nobody owns it. The traveler owns themselves. They can deploy their identity and their you know, amount of money they have, their tiers in their loyalty programs, etc., into touch points, one being the hotel chain, one being the OTA, etc. So once you've done that, you have that, that infrastructure in place. Then composability comes across. Imagine a, an airline that I cannot name that we're working with that decides now to represent on-chain or tokenize uh, their loyalty points. So now their million of customers can testify or certify that they own that kind of tier in the loyalty program. A hotel chain could uh, accept those points without necessarily affiliating to that brand. Small independent hotels have a hard time with loyalty because the repetition is not fast enough and because they pay in brand once they adopt a bigger chain uh, loyalty program just to make it more useful. So usability is actually something that could be obtained by federating at the low level on blockchain uh, loyalty programs. So I vote for loyalty programs on chain. Right, loyalty. So that's where we see it happening. Can I add one before please, I finish? The yeah, one please. I particularly like, Close, but not a use case. is uh, bookings as NFTs. So today when I make a booking to a hotel directly or through an OTA, I have a contract, and then if I cancel, I break the contract, or we, we make the contract void. When you represent the bookings as NFTs, they become digital assets. Now, Web3, so the new internet with blockchain, can actually manage digital assets. So I make a booking, and this becomes something I own. Then I can give it to somebody else. Maybe instead of canceling, I can sell it to somebody else. So that's a completely change of paradigm, which I find very interesting. Also very dangerous in many ways, but I think this is like something very interesting to look at. Right, and what would you say, the two of you? Where can we meet you for the next three days? Where can you be found for further conversations? So I'm at the Peak Work booth, which is in 4.1, if I'm not wrong, 107. Check the website, there's a, there's yeah. a list. And you can see me commuting around. I'm also at the Chain for Travel booth sometimes. And I'll be around and check if there's a lot of adoption going on. I saw some crypto plays. So, interesting. I don't know, but I go often to Camino because they have good coffee. Oh, they have good coffee. That's good to know <laughs> for everyone here. <laughs> don't feel, oh, want to have a good coffee. Yeah. No, and of course, I mean, connect on LinkedIn. I think that's what you're up for, right? Um, Luca, you have a, a podcast yourself. Um, I think following you on LinkedIn as well, it's a good choice if you want to stay up to date with okay. your thoughts and comments on the industry. So, thank you very much. Thank you for your attention. We're heading into a break now until 2.30. We have uh, Luca Di Giulio from Web3 um, in Travel. And you, Mikhail Rubel from Peakwork, thank you so much. It was Thank a you. pleasure.